Hi everybody, uh, my name's Ashley King and I'm a lecturer in planetary science in the School of Physical Sciences at the Open University. Uh, this is the second of these lockdown lectures that I recorded. Um, the first one, if you, if you go back, was about meteorites. So these are rocky pieces of asteroids and other planetary bodies that land on the Earth's surface. And we're able to, to collect those rocks. Um, we can study them in the laboratory. Uh, and they give us some insight into how the solar system has formed and evolved over the last sort of four and a half billion years or so. And today I'm kind of working my way backwards slightly and I'm going to talk about meteors and fireballs. So this is what happens when some of that extraterrestrial material enters the Earth's atmosphere, travels through the atmosphere um, before that rocky material lands um, on the Earth's surface. Let's see if I can get this to do the next slide. There we go. So it's estimated that between around sort of 50,000 up to about 100,000 kilos of extraterrestrial material actually enters the Earth's atmosphere every single day. Um, so that's a huge mass of stuff that's coming to us from space. Uh, and to give you an idea for any Douglas Adams um, fans out there, that was roughly the equivalent of about uh, a blue whale hitting the Earth um, every single day. And we can actually see this happening. Um, so on this photo here, you see this kind of bright streak just in the corner. So this is a meteor um, traveling through the Earth's atmosphere. And so this image, this photo was actually taken by an astronaut um, on board the International Space Station. Uh, and they actually have dedicated cameras now um, on the space station for recording extraterrestrial material um, as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. We can also see these though from the ground if we just watch the skies. Um, and so this one is a really spectacular um, meteor uh, in the sky here. Um, so this is extraterrestrial material traveling through the Earth's atmosphere. This image was taken um, in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, this is actually the European Southern Observatory um, telescopes down here. So we don't have to be on the space station to actually see um, extraterrestrial material arriving at the Earth. So what is a, a meteor? How do we get meteors and, and fireballs? So most of that sort of 50 to 100,000 kilos of, of extraterrestrial material that, that enters the Earth's atmosphere are actually tiny, tiny dust grains. They're not huge, big lumps of rock or metal. Um, they're small grains, probably think about, imagine something around the size of a grain of sand that you would find um, on a beach, for example. Uh, they're traveling really fast though, so they're going anywhere from about 10 to 70 kilometers per second. Uh, and what happens is they come out of the vacuum of space and they enter the Earth's atmosphere, which is much, much denser. Uh, and this causes them to slow down very quickly. Uh, and most of those materials will actually just burn up um, in the atmosphere as they're, as they're traveling through it. And so this generates a really bright streak in the sky. Um, so sometimes these can last for, for a second or two. And that's what we call a meteor. Um, and you'll sometimes commonly hear these referred to as uh, shooting stars, um, but they are not stars moving across the night sky. They're actually bits of extraterrestrial material coming in from space uh, and, and being slowed down and burning up within the, in the Earth's atmosphere. So we often think of the solar system as being quite an empty place. Um, we think there's lots of kind of, there's lots of gaps, uh, lots of space, you could say, between the planets and the asteroids and the comets and the, the, the sun at the center of our solar system. But actually, our solar system is incredibly um, dusty. And uh, we've had impacts between different asteroids, different planetary bodies for the last sort of four and a half billion years. We've also had the breakup of comets as they travel in from the outer solar system towards the inner solar system. Um, and all of these events over four and a half billion years have generated huge amounts of dust. So even though there's lots of kind of um, dis great distances between the planets, uh, there's lots of dust that fills that, that space. So the solar system is a really dusty um, place. Uh, and so this is the dust that produces uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is the dust that produces um, the extraterrestrial, it's a source of extraterrestrial material that, that's hitting the Earth's atmosphere. So most um, of that dust, um, the main producer of dust in the solar system um, and the main producer of dust that arrives at the Earth um, are comets. And we, comets are kind of uh, icy and rocky mixtures that formed in the outer parts of the solar system. So they formed in 
in places a long way from the sun where temperatures were really cold, um, where you were able to accrete um, ices together. So if these things form too close to the sun, you don't have any ices available because the temperatures are too high. So these things come from what we think, or what we call the, the Kuiper Belt. So this is the region of kind of icy leftover planetesimals right at the edge of our solar system. So um, they're about, it's about 30 to 50 astronomical units away. So remember one astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth um, and the Sun. So it's about uh, 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers. So these come from about 30 uh, astronomical units away and further. So the Kuiper Belt is where Pluto sits, just to give you some idea. Um, also, we have this uh, cloud called the Oort Cloud, which is even further out. And it's kind of um, a source of really distant comets to, the, to our solar system. And so comets are often thought of as dirty snowballs because they have this kind of icy, uh, rocky type of composition to them. And so what happens when a comet um, is traveling on its orbit and it comes into the inner solar system is it starts to get heated up. So it comes in from a really cold region of space, long way from the sun, it gets closer to the sun. Uh, this causes it to heat up uh, and it causes those ices to sublimate. So they go from being uh, in the solid phase, being like, uh, like solid ice, to actually um, uh, being in the, in the gas phase. So this is sublimation goes on. And so when this happens, you produce these huge comas. Um, so you can see that on the image at the bottom here, there's kind of a, a coma um, of gas and dust around Comet Halley down here. Um, so you get comas, you get uh, gas tails, but all of the dust that's entrained within the um, ice as well um, is ejected or is lost from that comet. So they have these really spectacular dusty tails to them um, that, that sit behind them in their orbits as they go around the sun. And so this comets, when they come into the inner solar system, are producing huge amounts of dust. Uh, and sometimes that dust enters the Earth's atmosphere and that's when we start seeing uh, meteors. Uh, just to give you an idea of how dusty um, the, uh, comets are, this was recorded by the uh, European Space Agency's Rosetta mission um, to Comet 67P, so it actually had a little lander that went onto the surface. And so this is a really short little clip, but it shows you how dusty the environment around this comet um, was. And so all this dust travels out into space, um, and some of that ends up uh, entering into the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so comets are the main source of dust to the Earth, uh, and we sometimes see these in what we call meteor showers. Uh, so these are kind of increases or spikes in the number of meteors that we see at regular intervals um, throughout the year. And these are related to how uh, the time of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So on this kind of cartoon here that I've taken from the NASA um, website, you can see we have the sun um, at the center here, this big yellow circle. Uh, and this blue line here um, represents the orbit of um, Earth. Um, so this is Earth traveling around the sun. And so this kind of gray fuzzy band that cuts across here. Um, this is a stream of dust, a hypothetical, uh, this is a cartoon, remember, stream of dust um, coming out from a comet. So this comet has come, traveled in from the outer solar system, come into the inner solar system, sublimation has taken place, all this dust has escaped the comet, and it forms this spectacular tail behind it. And as this comet goes round and round the sun on this orbit, it leaves this trail of dust behind it on its orbital path. And so what happens to produce a meteor shower um, is that the Earth actually travels through that um, uh, path of dust behind the comet. So you can see here, um, when the Earth goes through this region here, we're passing through the stream of dust from a comet. And so we'll see an increase in the number of meteors um, that we detect. And as the Earth travels around again, at this point here, we would again go through this stream of comet dust and see another increase. And so these increases, as I said, are what we call uh, meteor showers. And so there are just over 100 or so established um, meteor showers but, um, established by the International Astronomical Union. There are many more that haven't been officially confirmed yet. So, um, so we, you can see it gives you a feel for how many or how much extraterrestrial material um, is, is arriving here on Earth. These are some examples of some of the more spectacular ones that you'll see, um, can see throughout the year in the UK. Um, in particular, Persids are probably the most famous. Um, and they happen in August each year. And the source of the Persids is Comet um, 109P. 
um, or Comet Swift Tuttle to give it its, its more catchy title. Um, so what's happening is the Earth is crossing the um, orbit or the, of the dust that's coming out from, from Swift Tuttle. And the Persids are quite well known because they happen in August, so the viewing conditions are quite nice. It's the summer, um, so it's not too unpleasant to be out really early in the morning at two, three o'clock in the morning. And also because um, you, we get lots of meteors. So anything up to around uh, 100 per hour meteors, um, number of meteors are visible. Um, it's important to remember, so these are kind of guides for the number of meteors that you would actually be able to see from these um, different meteor showers. <clears throat> it really does depend on where you are, um, what your viewing conditions are. So, so it's much easier to see meteors, particularly the faint ones, if you're in um, places away from big cities where you have really dark skies. Um, that doesn't mean you can't see meteors in, in central, um, really brightly lit cities. So I've seen meteors in, in London, for example, um, but, uh, but it does definitely affect the, the number that you can see. <clears throat> and things like the moon, um, so this changes from year to year, but if the moon's really bright, that makes it quite difficult again to see the, the faintest meteors. So, so whenever you see a news story saying, oh, there's going to be a spectacular meteor shower, and you'll see 200 meteors per hour, um, it's also really it's important to, to remember that the, the viewing conditions um, uh, kind of limit what you can see. Um, so, so it's always uh, good to, I don't want to downplay how spectacular these things are, but it's always, um, uh, don't build up your hopes too much sometimes. Um, what I would say, if you are going to go and look for, uh, uh, try and observe uh, meteor showers, and you can see meteors, these, these happen to be showers where we see big um, increases in the number of meteors, but you can see meteors every single night, um, um, just not at these kind of rates. Um, well, what I, as I said, what I would say is uh, it's important to give your times, uh, give your eyes time to adjust to the night sky. So, so don't just sort of step outside and think you're going to suddenly see lots and lots of meteors. Your, your eyes will actually need um, a period of time to adjust to the darkness. And so that's a kind of key tip if you're going to try and do some meteor observing at some time um, this year. So the other really spectacular, or sometimes spectacular, meteor shower that we get are the, are the Geminids. Um, these happen in December each year. And you can see we get similar rates up to about 100, 120 meteors per hour with the Geminids. Viewing maybe isn't quite so much fun because it's December rather than August. So um, you have to wrap up warm if you want to go and look at these. But they're interesting because they come from this object called Phaethon. Um, and Phaethon actually is classified as an asteroid rather than a comet. So asteroids are generally are rocky bodies. Um, comets are these kind of mixtures of, of ice and dust. Uh, and comets produce um, uh, regular events where they lose gas and, uh, and dust. And so and, and asteroids aren't generally thought to do that. But Phaethon um, is one of these rare asteroids that, that does seem to be losing material as it goes around on its orbit um, uh, around the sun. And so it's kind of been dubbed a, a rock comet. We don't know very much about Phaethon, but there is going to be a mission called Destiny Plus, I think it's called, um, which is going to go and um, study this object and see whether it's an asteroid or a comet or a little bit of a mixture of both. So it's a really interesting um, source of extraterrestrial material to the Earth. Okay, so as I said, when that, most of the extraterrestrial material that, that arrives at the Earth is tiny dust grains. Most of that dust grain, most of those dust grains um, burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and we never see them again after that um, meteor, um, uh, <clears throat> after that meteor event. Some, uh, a small amount, do actually rain down onto the Earth's surface and can be collected. Um, and so these are what we call micro meteorites, so really small sort of tens of microns in size um, grains um, do actually survive and, and people study these things. Um, and they can be collected, it's been known to be collect these things um, using magnets from, from gutters on rooftops or by going to Antarctica and melting the ice and sieving for the, for the tiny dust grains. But we can also um, go and collect them actually kind of out of the sky. So sometimes NASA will send up um, these planes into the upper uh, sort of stratosphere of the Earth and uh, they'll kind of have a sticky pad on them and they'll put that pad out and try and collect some of the dust that's, that's raining down onto the Earth. And so this is an electron microscope image of one of those. These are what we call um, interplanetary dust particles. Oh, excuse me. 
Um, and so you, this is a picture, as I said, taken by uh, under an electron microscope. So this is the scale bar. This is about one micron or so, the scale bar. Um, so to give you an idea, uh, human hair is about 100 microns in size. So this is about 100 times less than the, than the width of a human hair. And so what you can hopefully see is this is kind of an aggregate of lots of smaller grains. They're really loosely held together. It's a really porous um, looking thing. So there's lots of kind of space between these things. So it's kind of a loosely bound um, thing that isn't held together uh, particularly cohesively. And um, this is really similar to what we think that the dust uh, at the start of the solar system would have looked like. These tiny, tiny dust grains sort of sticking together in these loose aggregates. Um, and then these things start colliding together to make bigger and bigger grains that go on to make asteroids and comets. And then those asteroids and comets go on to make um, planets. So these really are the kind of pristine building blocks um, that tell us about the formation uh, of the solar system. Okay, so I've mainly talked about um, uh, tiny dust particles that are hitting and coming in through the Earth's atmosphere. So this dust that's coming from comets, we do also get dust from asteroids as well. Um, so it's not just comets that are producing, producing all this extraterrestrial material. Uh, but what we do know is that um, we also have bigger samples. We have meteorites. Um, we have big rocks that we can analyze in the laboratory. And so this is telling us that larger objects are also coming in sometimes through the Earth's atmosphere. And there's been a recent study um, just a few weeks ago that estimates that we get about 17,000 meteorite falls um, each year. Obviously, most of the Earth's surface is covered in oceans, so lots of those will end up um, just falling into the ocean or never seen by anybody. Um, most of the other ones will end up in uninhabited places like deserts, so so places like Africa or Australia um, or uh, places like Antarctica. So these things aren't seen by people, so they kind of just um, fall and they're, and they're never recovered. Uh, and so uh, we probably only get out of that 17,000, we probably only get about 20 to 30 new meteorite falls recovered each year. Um, so it's not a huge uh, amount compared to the amount of stuff that's actually arriving here on Earth. And so what happens when one of these bigger objects comes in through the Earth's atmosphere? Uh, hopefully this little video will play. So you'll see um, we get this really, really bright streak. So this is much, much brighter than a typical um, meteor that we would get from a tiny grain. So this is brighter than the sun at some points, this one. Um, it's a huge bright streak. So we tend to call these, these brighter ones are called fireballs or bolides. Um, so we'd start, uh, we, we like our confusing names. So most, most of the small ones from dust grains are called meteors. These really bright ones are fireballs and, and bolides. Um, and it's just based really on, the, on how bright these objects are. So this one, as you, you can see in this video, is really, really bright. Um, and occasionally, not always, but sometimes, and this one did, um, the object actually explodes. The pressure from the atmosphere causes it to explode um, in something that we call an airburst. So you may have seen, um, uh, this video or similar videos to this before. This is quite a famous meteorite fall. This is Chelyabinsk, which fell in Russia uh, on the 15th of February in 2013. And you can see it fell, it was early, it was in, yeah, about half past nine in the morning. So it actually fell um, during the daytime. So, so we normally see meteors, for example, at nighttime, but that's just because the skies are dark and we're actually able to see them. But, but extraterrestrial material is entering the Earth's atmosphere all the time. Um, so this was a, a, an early morning fireball, I'll just play it again, um, in Russia. Uh, and so the rock that produced this was probably about 20 meters in size, uh, and it was going at about 20 kilometers per second. Uh, and then that explosion that you see at the end um, of this happened at about 30 kilometers or so um, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere, at a height of about 30 kilometers. And so uh, this explosion produced about a thousand kilos of meteorites that actually rained down onto, onto the um, town or city of Chelyabinsk. Um, and none of those meteorites actually fortunately not hurt anybody or, or caused any damage, um, caused any damage to people anyway. Um, there's lots of damage to property. Um, lots of buildings were, were hit by these things, um, cars and, and things. 
Uh, but also the shockwave from the explosion at the end of this actually caused um, damage to property in particular. It, um, it caused the windows in buildings to shatter. So there were some people that had to go to hospital with injuries, mainly from glass um, falling down um, onto them. So I'll just play it one more time. It's a really amazing event. I remember being at work and hearing about this when it came through, completely distracted for the whole day. Um, so yeah, these stones, about a thousand kilos of, of, of meteorites in, in lots of different stones um, fell to the uh, surface of the air. So Chernobyl was quite a, an extreme example. Um, so most uh, meteorite dropping events are not that large. Um, so the really big ones like Chelyabinsk are, are rare, they only happen every um, few thousand years or so. The really nice thing about Chelyabinsk um, is that it happened during the day, so lots of people saw it. Um, lots of people uh, in Russia had dash cam. It's quite common now to have these dash cam um, uh, recording devices in your cars as you drive around. And so there's lots and lots of footage of, of Chelyabinsk coming down and lots of eyewitness events and also because it was such a bright event it was a bit difficult to miss if you were in the area um, and so this means that uh, we have lots of video um, recordings that we can work with to actually um, estimate uh, how big that object was how quickly it was traveling where those meteorites fell although for this one because it kind of exploded in the sky it wasn't wasn't too difficult to work that out uh, but it also means we could work out um, where that object where that rocky piece of an asteroid came from so it's really um, being able to, to witness uh, meteorite events using cameras, looking from several different locations is really important for helping us to understand um, the pre what we call the pre-atmospheric orbit. So, so whereabouts in the solar system that material came from. And also, um, particularly for the smaller ones where we don't have this big explosion of rocks and we're just looking for maybe a single rock or a, or a few smaller rocks, um, uh, it's really important because we're able to work out uh, where those meteorites may have landed on the Earth's surface. So this provides us with context. It, it provides us with some information about um, what uh, what part of the solar system um, this material is coming from, where what part of the solar system are we investigating when we study those meteorites? Are we looking at something from the asteroid belt or are we looking at something from beyond the orbit of Jupiter? And knowing where those meteorites fall is also really important for recovering them quickly. Um, so we want to minimize their interaction um, uh, with the um, Earth's atmosphere. So the Earth's atmosphere alters these things really, really quickly. And it depends a little bit on the type of meteorite. Um, some of the really kind of soft, pristine ones won't survive for very long in, in sat on the surface of the Earth. Some of the rockier, more iron-rich ones will hang around a bit longer. So, so ideally, for meteorites, we want to know whereabouts they fell so we can recover them really quickly and we want to know whereabouts they came from so we can learn a little bit more about how the solar system formed. So this is, um, <coughs> again, this is a, a model based, uh, there was lots of footage for Chelyabinsk. Um, and so this red line here, um, oh, get the cursor to come back, uh, shows you the pre-atmospheric pre orbit um, of the Chelyabinsk um, rock before it hit the, Earth's, um, surf, uh, hit the Earth's atmosphere. So we can actually work out that this thing was coming, so this is Mars here, um, and this is this must be Jupiter out here. So we can actually work out, this is how this object was traveling around the sun before it arrived on the Earth. And so it tells us that this, um, uh, that this rocky object was probably coming from the asteroid belt and the inner part of the asteroid belt that sits between um, the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So remember the asteroid belt is kind of like uh, the rocky leftover material, um, so the building blocks of, of planet formation. So all the stuff that didn't go into planets. So it's primitive, pristine material, four and a half billion years old, tells us how um, planets were forming in the early solar system. So this is really important um, information to know whereabouts in the solar system our meteorites are coming from. Um, and as I said, then we want to recover them really quickly so that we can uh, minimize um, their interaction, stop them being altered by the terrestrial environment. And so we have uh, worldwide, the collection of meteorites is probably about 60, just over 60,000. Um, we only have uh, pre-atmospheric orbits available for about 30 or 40 of those meteorites. So it's a really, really small um, number. We, it's really important for us to try and understand try and increase that number to understand the kind of flux of extraterrestrial material to the Earth. 
<coughs> so one of the ways we can do that is by building camera networks that are dedicated to um, watching for extraterrestrial material entering the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and camera networks have been going around for, for, for decades now and they've been built all across um, the world. Um, so there's lots of these things. Um, often they, some of them are run by places, people like NASA or scientific institutes, but often there's also lots of amateur networks that have been set up to do this. Um, they're relatively simple things to, to put together, um, depending on what you want to observe. And I just thought I'd highlight some of the networks that are currently um, operating in the United Kingdom at the moment. Um, so probably the biggest one is UK MON, the UK Meteor Observation Network. Um, so you can go and look these things up on, online. Um, so these are mainly CCTV cameras um, looking for uh, meteors as they come in um, over the UK. And we also have Nematode, which does something similar. Uh, then we also have uh, SCAMP, which is the system for capture of asteroid and meteorite paths. Um, and SCAMP cameras are designed really, they're not so good for doing meteors, but they're, they're good for doing the brighter fireballs, so hopefully helping us to find um, potential meteorite dropping events. And it's called SCAMP because it's an extension of the French uh, Frippon um, network. And I believe Frippon uh, in French uh, means rascal. So we decided uh, we use the same cameras as the Frippon network. And so we decided to call our UK network SCAMP um, to go with the rascal. And then we also have the, the UK Fireball Network, um, a little picture of one of their cameras here. Um, and again, these are cameras designed for really for recording um, fireball events and helping us to find um, possible meteorites in the UK. And this network um, builds on um, the Desert Fireball Network that's been really successful um, out in Australia. So there's a whole network of camera, cameras across Australia and they've actually recovered um, a few meteorites from, from the deserts in Australia using this, this, this fireball network. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the kinds of um, uh, recordings that we get from some of these cameras. So this is a, uh, a camera that I put together. Um, and it's actually on the roof of the Natural History Museum in London. Um, so as I said, you can see meteors um, even with your eyes and using cameras, um, even if you're in big cities. So these are the, these are the towers at the front of the museum. Uh, this is a really simple little thing. So it's a, it's a little CCTV camera in a housing unit uh, and it's connected to a computer on the other side of this wall. Um, and that computer is on all the time and it has a little piece of software that's designed for detecting uh, meteors. And so you can see in this bottom image, this is just the top of one of the towers at the museum. And this is kind of a long meteor coming in here. So this is the kind of stuff that we record um, using our cameras. And hopefully if we see events like this from, from multiple locations, we can actually work out um, whereabouts, um, how quickly that material was going and we can start working out whereabouts in the solar system it came from. The one in the top, you can't quite see a meteor event, but you can hopefully see um, a really bright flash. So we kind of just caught the edge of this, um, a meteor event, I should say. We just kind of caught the, the edge of this one, um, but didn't get a full view. It was a really spectacular event from a, from a few years ago. Uh, so spectacular that it actually was record, uh, seen. Um, so it happened about three o'clock in the morning, I think it was, but it was still um, seen by lots and lots of people, either going home from work uh, or going to work or just out and about at that time of night. Um, and so it was so bright that actually it was recorded by lots and lots of people. It was witnessed by lots of people and it made the, the national news. Um, so this was in, it was actually St. Patrick's Day um, in 2016. So I remember again being, I was actually in the lab the day that this happened. I remember um, getting to work and racing to try and find the, the footage, um, see if we caught it on our camera. We just caught the edge of it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of eyewitness reports of this. Uh, and it was also uh, picked up by um, uh, three of the cameras, uh, at least three of the cameras, maybe a few more as well, uh, in the UK MON network. So these are some of the images um, of that fireball event um, above the UK in 2016. Um, so these are three images from three different cameras. And so within a few hours, using um, that footage that had been recorded, we were able to work out the path of that fireball. Um, so that's the yellow line on here. This is the path of the fireball traveling over the UK on St. Patrick's Day 
um, the early hours of St. Patrick's Day in 2016. So these green lines show you, uh, this, these are the cameras that were used to actually triangulate and calculate this, this, um, this path across the UK. And then I think it wasn't many more hours, probably um, uh, later in the evening that night or, or early the next morning, and we actually had a, a rough orbit um, calculated for where that object um, came from. So this is my cartoon sketch. So this is um, Earth in blue and Mars in red. This is our asteroid belt here. So this, the asteroid belt is the main source of, of meteorites to the Earth, but it's not the only source. Um, and so what was really interesting about um, this event was, get my cursor back, that it came in on this really elliptical orbit. Most things going around the sun have much more circular orbits. So it came in on a really elliptical orbit, and you can see it was coming from uh, the area around Jupiter. So this is really exciting for us because um, this points to something that potentially was cometary um, in origin, or at least something that's coming to us from the outer part of the solar system where we were expecting to get these really pristine, primitive, uh, kind of volatile rich, um, organic material rich type um, objects. We don't have many of these um, or relatively few of these in our meteorite collection. So it's really exciting whenever um, we see things whoop, from, from out this, in this region. And so we were able to calculate this orbit based on, on, those, on the footage. Um, we got estimates for the mass, uh, so about 70 kilos or so. And we think it was traveling at about 50 um, kilometers per second. But unfortunately, this is really quite quick. Uh, it's probably too quick for any uh, material to have survived. Um, as meteorites. So even though this was a really bright, spectacular event above the UK, um, we think that the material was probably, if, if it's coming from the outer solar system, it's probably very friable, it's probably quite soft, it won't survive coming in through the Earth's atmosphere um, at 50 kilometers per second. So even though it's really exciting, we thought we might have something maybe even cometary-like um, in origin. Uh, we don't think that any uh, significant meteorites fell to the, to the um, UK um, during this event, but next time, hopefully. And so and we are still watching the skies, as Mulder would say. Um, so these are some images from our um, SCAMP cameras. Uh, this is just a couple of weeks ago, and I just found another one this morning. Um, so these are recorded. So this one here, this is just a, a, a bright fireball or a bright meteor, so um, recorded by the, Car uh, the Cardiff, we have a camera in Cardiff. This is Honiton down in, in Devon on the, on the um, south coast. This, you probably can't see this in here, but there's a little faint one. So this is um, recorded in, by a camera in northern France. So these aren't just networks working together um, individually in their own countries. Um, we're actually starting to, to have networks across multiple countries. Um, there's the European um, network. And there are moves to start creating a global fireball network so we cover most of the Earth's surface in these cameras so we can record these materials. Um, so as I said, this one was just captured by three different cameras um, a few weeks ago and we calculate an orbit uh, and this goes out to, um, uh, you can see again, we have this kind of elliptical orbit and this is probably, this was a much smaller event, so no um, meteorites or anything from this, but it just shows you how quickly um, uh, with multiple observations we can quickly calculate uh, an orbit and we can also work out where the meteorites are likely to have fallen uh, and if they have whereabouts um, those meteorites might be. And so just to finish uh, I thought I'd show this picture of the Glatton meteorite. So uh, we have about 20, so the UK is quite a small country relative, it's quite, you know, we don't have so much mat, land mass, um, so that means the chances of meteorites falling here, landing in the UK are, are relatively small compared to, to much larger countries, say like Australia or the USA. Um, that means we don't, it doesn't, doesn't mean we don't get any meteorites. Um, there are about uh, 20 or so UK meteorites. Uh, and this one here, Glatton, was the last one to fall um, and be recovered in the UK. So this actually happened in 1991. Um, so that's nearly 20 years ago. Um, so I would say we're due another one, <laughs> but we can't actually predict um, when meteorites um, are going to fall within the UK. Um, so hopefully it will be sometime soon. Um, and we are now ready. Um, the networks are still expanding, but we're now in a good position where if something does fall in the UK, um, we should be able to record it coming in. 
uh, and that means we'll be able to, I mean, in an ideal world, it would hopefully hit somebody's car or something, so it would make it much easier to fall. Um, the chances are it's going to end up in a more um, remote location um, in the hills or, or in forested areas. Um, and so having the cameras, we'll be able to see it coming in, we'll hopefully be able to to uh, estimate where those meteorites may have fallen so we can go out and recover them really quickly um, and also then we'll be able to calculate whereabouts in that in the solar system it was coming from so hopefully um, we don't know when it will happen um, but we're optimistic that at some point in the not too distant future we might be able to recover the next uk meteorite fall and with that i will stop and uh, thank you very much <laughs>